I do often wonder, like, what if I hadn't left San Francisco? Like, I mean, like, if my friend hadn't called me up and said, like, hey, do you want to move to New York? Like, uh, yeah, like, I probably would still be in San Francisco right now as well. And my life wouldn't be anything like it is now. Again, I met my wife in New York, so I wouldn't have met my wife as well. Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode number 29 of the Immigrant Slide podcast, where we share stories of people who left their country to chase a better life. I'm Daniel DiBiasi, and my guest this week is Mabs. Mabs is originally from Pakistan and moved to the UK when he was four years old. After graduating from university, they offered him a job in San Francisco to work for a tech startup company. He accepted the job and started a new life in the US. After a long process and waiting, Mabs received his green card and later his American citizenship. Before moving to my conversation with Mabs, consider subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. It will be great if you leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. And now, please enjoy my conversation with Mabs. Hi, Mabs. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me on. No worries. It's actually a pleasure because I listen to another podcast that I listen regularly and you were a guest on this podcast. So I'm pretty stoked having you on my podcast now. It's funny because a few people recently have told me that like I'm like famous now and I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm just this little guy who works in upstate New York. I'm not famous at all. <laughs> it, now with internet, I mean, the, the <laughs> definition of famous is it's kind of different. Before it was like you have to be on TV to be famous. Now you right. have to have followers or you need to be in this case like a guest on a kind of popular <laughs> podcast. You become famous automatically. Yeah, so, yeah, no, yeah, and I, I mean, I, and I've got the advantage of I've been around for a really long time now as well, so I'm getting a little bit older than most of the people on the scene. So, so just by virtue of being around longer, you know, I get kind of in, invited on kind of onto things because I've known people for such a long time. So that helps as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but today you're on this podcast because you have an immigrant story because you're usually on podcasts after really technology or tech things, but today is like about your immigration yeah, story. Absolutely, yeah, I've got a long and <laughs> windy story as well. Because <laughs> <laughs> your technically your immigration story started when you were four, when your parents left Pakistan to move to, to England. Yeah, so yeah, I was born in a little village up in the north of Pakistan. I won't say exactly when, but it was over 40 years ago <laughs> now. Um, but yeah, so and then my, my actually, so my father went to England to study. And then when he finished studying, uh, he decided he didn't want to go back to Pakistan. And so, yeah, he, he basically uh, at that point kind of arranged for the entire family to move from Pakistan over to um, England instead. So yeah, so and that was when I was about four years old. You are a child of immigrants. And I heard these things multiple times that the parents, like immigrant parents, have high expectation on their children. Did you feel that way or how it was for you to growing up in, uh, in England? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, honestly, coming from a Pakistani family, I think most Pakistani parents have high expectations of their kids. It doesn't matter whether you're immigrants or not. But I mean, there was, I think there was always the expectation that, you know, since we were in England, we were getting a, you know, a very good education that, you know, me and my siblings, I'm the youngest of four kids as well. We would be lawyers and accountants and, you know, that kind of professional kind of, kind of individual I didn't follow through on that, but, <laughs> but well, kind of did, but not really. It wasn't the plan that, that I think my parents had. But no, I think, I think, yeah, I think, like I said, coming from Pakistan, I think, I think most parents there have this kind of high expectation of their kids. I think maybe perhaps, you know, moving to England. I mean, my dad went to England to study, so he obviously saw the sort of value of, of, of kind of moving to England to kind of study. So I think, you know, that's one of the reasons that they moved so that we would have that education and then have the, the sort of high opportunities that were associated with that as well. So I guess your father went to university in England. Um, it was kind of a college. I don't know if it was a university per se. So he finished. He was in the um, he was in the army in Pakistan when he got discharged from the army. He went to England to study. He did electrical engineering, I believe. But he was not an electrical engineer, <laughs> but, but he was uh, obviously a very smart guy. And um, so he, uh, once he finished his education, uh, he actually purchased a, uh, a, like a little grocery store kind of thing. He just wanted to, he wanted to run his own business. And so, yeah, so the family had like a, a, a grocery store that we all kind of ran. Okay, so it didn't really follow the path of electrical engineer. No, I mean, I think, you know, again, you know, because, yeah, I think that was just, you know, this is you know, going back to the 1970s in England and stuff. So I think it was, 
it was kind of a hard thing, uh, you know, to, just to kind of find that kind of work. And being an immigrant, probably it was harder to find that kind of work uh, as well. And so, yeah, but like I said, I think he wanted to kind of do his own thing as well. I think that was the sort of other factor as well. So he just started along that path instead. And you kind of follow a similar path because then you graduated from university and you decided to move to, to the U.S.? Yeah, so I went to, you know, so I was four, so I, I hadn't really started school in Pakistan or anything like that. So my, my entire education was from England. I went to, I went to school, university after that. Um, I did get a job in England first. I worked for about, well, I got one job with Oracle in the UK. I lasted three months there. I, I just decided I didn't want to work for like a big software company. I lasted about three months and then I got offered a job with a little startup. It was actually an Australian company, but they were they were running an event in the UK. So they had hired some people in the UK and then they had decided that they were going to move all of their staff from all over the world. So they had some people in the UK, some people in Australia. They were going to move them all to San Francisco in the States. And after uh, having, yeah, I, I mean, they kind of mentioned when they were like trying to recruit me that we we may end up moving you to America, or at least that would be an option. And so that was actually one of the reasons I ended up taking the job. <laughs> but but yeah, so after about six months of working in England, uh, they offered to move me out to the States. And I said, absolutely. <laughs> so you were already planning to move to the U.S.? I don't know if I was planning on it, but I think I was always looking for the opportunity. Like, I, you know, I, I wanted to travel more and I wanted to see the world a little bit more as well. And the States was always really appealing. Just again, just just like the same kind of, as you mentioned, my father saw some opportunities of, you know, being an immigrant as well, uh, being in software and working with the Internet and stuff, being in San Francisco in... 1996, 97 uh, was the place you had to be. So when I was off that opportunity, I said, I said, absolutely, because that's that's where I want to be. <laughs> because you were in, like, in, into technology. It's actually, what was your job title? What, how did you graduate from school? What was your background? Uh, yeah, so I have, a, I have a computer science degree specializing in software engineering. Okay. Yeah, definitely San Francisco is the place to be if you are a software engineer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started I started playing around with computers when I was about eight years old. Just, you know, we got just like, I was a Commodore VIC-20 back then. And, you know, that was the first thing that arrived in the house. And so you play video games on it. And after a while, I got tired of playing video games because we only had a few. Um, and I started playing the same things over and over again. So then I just started to like hack on the computers, just write code and read magazines and copy code out of magazines and stuff. And then it just kind of escalated out of there. Like I would just I would just kind of learn more, learn new languages and things like that. And by the time I went to university, I, I kind of already knew how to code. Again, going back to like, you know, 1992 was when I started university. You kind of had to go to university back then if you wanted to do software engineering. Now it's, you know, Yes, it's still encouraged, but you don't have to. So back then I kind of felt like I had to go to university, even though I already knew how to code and everything like that, just so I could have the piece of paper that said I was a software engineer. <laughs> And when you graduated, pretty much it was the golden age for for internet where the internet started. Yeah, I mean it was just it was just becoming a commercial entity at that point. Like obviously, this internet had existed since the 1960s, but at that point it was primarily a kind of education slash military thing. Around 94, 95 was when you know it it started opening up to kind of enterprise and to kind of anybody who wanted to be able to be sort of on the internet. And and yeah, so it was just a. Uh, it was kind of just an amazing time to be in San Francisco and, and to be around, you know, sort of everything that was happening on, on the internet and just to see it all just happen as well. Even even if you weren't working in it, just to kind of be around and be able to see say that you were there, I think was an amazing opportunity as well. Totally. But did they send you there or like did you move it to the US because you were like a really good, your job? Or there were like a shortage in software developer. What was uh, the reason why they moved you from England to to the US? Um, I mean, for them, I think it was more. Again, it was like they were and they were an internet startup. Uh, they were in. They happened to be in Australia at the time when when they started. And but obviously, again, being a software company, being an internet software company trying to raise money and do all that kind of fun stuff. It didn't really make sense for them to be in Australia kind of back then. And and so they moved the company from Australia to San Francisco. And again, you know, again, you kind of have to go back in time a little bit and say, well, back in 1996, the whole remote work thing is not a thing, right? So, so you kind of have to have everybody in the same place. You kind of have to have an office and you have to get everybody in the same place. And so... 
Yeah, I mean, I think they're probably not that there was a shortage. It was just they, there's not too many people who know software and know internet software in 1986. So if you have somebody on staff who's working for you who kind of has that experience, then it's absolutely, you know, do you want to go move? Uh, I mean, had I said no, like I, I mean, had I said I want to stay in England, they, they, I probably still would have worked with them, right? But uh, so it's not like they would have just said, okay, that's, that's it, Mubs, <laughs> we'll see you later. But obviously it just kind of made more sense for to, to, to kind of move as many people as they could over to San Francisco instead. Yeah, no, I bet. But at the same time, it will be easier just to open a, a new office in San Francisco. I look at people, you don't have to go through the old immigration process, sending people, move people, relocate them and everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, sort of at the time, there's not too many people who've got experience. I mean, I, I already knew how to code in Java at the time. I knew how to build sites at the time. I already knew HTML and things like that. So, you know, how many of those, even in the US, was there? How many people had that experience already uh, and kind of had that skill set already? So, yeah, so, I mean, I think it was a mixture of, I mean, they like I said, they kind of knew when they were hiring in England that there was a big chance that they would be moving people from, from England to uh, California as well. And, and so, yeah, so I think that was always part of the, the plan that they had. That they were just looking for people with those skills all over the world, I guess, essentially. <laughs> so I guess for you, it was like a kind of fairly easy to, to move to the U.S., at least, or through the immigration process. Yeah, the, the company handled everything in terms of I, I, I moved on a H-1B visa. They did all the application and everything. Um, wasn't really an issue back then. You know, it wasn't really an issue. Uh, I mean, I think one, I mean, obviously there was just, I think, timing and scheduling was the main issue there. Like you kind of had to do it at a certain time of the year to make sure that, because there's a certain number of those H-1B visas, they, they, they kind of still is. And if you don't do it at the right time of the year, you kind of miss and you have to wait until the next year. So so I think that was the only thing that, that was the main influence there was that you kind of had to do it when the lottery thing opened up essentially and make sure you had your application in kind of early. <laughs> And for people that don't know, what's the H-1B visa? What's for that? H-1B is just kind of a, uh, it's a visa that's meant to be that, it's meant to be for people who have a specific skill that isn't, uh, that there aren't enough people with that skill in the United States already. So if you want to come in on a H-1B visa, you kind of have to show that you have either some special skill, some special education. The company w will have trouble filling in the United States. And there's a certain number of those visas that they that they issue every year, and it's usually in around. It's usually at the, you usually have to apply at the start of the year, and they usually run out in three or four months or so. So for you, it was just like a, you got a visa and you were able to to stay for. Yeah, so you're able to stay for three years, and then you can renew it once for three years as well. So you can get on a H-1B visa that lasts for three years, and then you can renew it for another three years. After that, you either have to leave or you can try and, you know, get some other kind of visa instead. So I guess you stayed longer, so you decided to change your visa into something else. Well, while I was here, I met, my, well, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, we got engaged and married and you know, did all of that stuff. So, yes, yeah, so I, I, I applied for a green card. And then after I had my green card for a while, I applied for citizenship as well. Okay, so now you're like officially I'm a, an American. I'm an officially American, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like. <laughs> no, no, I've still got the accent, so <laughs> I don't know how long that'll last, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully a long time. <laughs> yeah. So the immigration process was fairly easy, but the emotional process was easy as well to leave your family and friends. <laughs> um, I mean, I think for me, I think it probably, it was at the beginning. I mean, you know, like I was very young, you know, I was, you know, a few months out of university. Like I said, I, I think I always wanted to travel and, and stuff anyway. So yeah, I think it was fairly easy. Um, I mean, I think, I think my parents were a little bit surprised when, when I said I wanted to leave. I mean, again, yeah, I coming from a very, you know, Southeast Asian background, you know, my, my, I will say my mum did everything for me. Like I never had to cook and clean or anything like that. My mum took very good care of me. Sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I think, I think they were a bit surprised because I was going to go move to California, move to San Francisco, live in an apartment on my own. Well, actually, no, I, I, I did have a roommate in the end, but you know, I would have to do everything myself. Like I have to cook and clean and take care of myself and have no help and be, have no help, right? Like it's not like I'm moving across town or something like that. I'm moving across the world. So I think I think my parents were a little bit surprised and they were very supportive. They were like, you know, if, if there's something that you want to do, you know, but I, I think secretly they 
they thought, oh, he'll be there for a month and he'll hate it because he'll have to do everything himself. And, you know, he's not going to be happy out there all by himself and he'll be back soon enough. But no, it's been a, it's been a long time and I'm still here. <laughs> he will come back with the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I said, if I, if, I mean, had I lived across town, I probably would have, but I didn't really have that option. <laughs> <laughs> Shipping it over would be too expensive. <laughs> yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fly home just so I can do my laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I was, I would say, I mean, the one thing with the whole like visa process and everything like that, uh, because I was on H1B visa, the the sort of there are certain restrictions, right? Like because it's like this, it's it's I think it's what they call a high skill um, visa. There's restrictions on like who you can work for. I mean, basically, somebody sponsors you, right? Like so, there's a company that sponsors you, and so you basically have to work for that company while you have the visa, and you can't work for anybody else, and you can't do anything else. So. I mean, although it was, you know, pretty straightforward and fairly simple to kind of apply for that. And it did end up like it, you know, once I was here and I was like, you know, there's so much opportunity, so many companies doing so many amazing things. And, you know, be like, oh, I wish I could go work for that company. I wish I could work for that company. And it, but it does limit your options because you can't, because you can't do any of that stuff. So, yeah. So even though it's, it's very cool, you know, just to just to have the opportunity, it, it, it was, it was some, it was somewhat, it was somewhat sad because there was plenty of opportunities that came up that I couldn't take advantage of because of the, the visa status that I was on as well. Did you manage to change company or you have to wait for a better better visa, better immigration status? Again, this is being in San Francisco and in the sort of startup world, you know, some companies just aren't set up to kind of sponsor you and, and, and kind of go through that legal process of kind of hiring and stuff like that too. So, so there, there's some opportunity, again, coming back in time these days it's less of a concern but still there's still some countries that just won't because it's just it's just extra expense and and kind of things like that so so some companies still kind of stay away from that kind of stuff as well and then yeah so there's so it does limit your options in terms of kind of who you can go work for and 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 kind of what your options are but yeah i mean there's there's certain legal things that you're not really supposed to work for other people. Um, you know, um, you can yeah you, know, you can do things where you differ payment essentially. I mean, like I, there was one instance where I went essentially went to work for somebody, but I I wasn't paid for like three months because I didn't have a visa with them, right? And so I got a good signing bonus <laughs> when when I actually started working with them because effectively I'd been working for them for three months. I just couldn't get paid until my visa came through instead. Yeah, that's that's actually a good point because I don't know if you had the same experience, but a company takes advantage of it because they know that you can't leave as easy. So you can't just have a, another opportunity and just move. It's much harder. Yeah, I mean, one 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 of the reasons I ended up leaving the first company that, you know, the company that actually moved me over to here was that I found out that I was basically being paid half of what I should have been getting paid if I was like an equivalent employee kind of in the, you know, had I just been hired as an employee sort of in the US, you know, I would have been making a lot more than, than I would have had I come over from me. You know, part of it was, you know, I was really young. I didn't know anything, you know, I didn't really, I didn't know how to, to research that kind of thing kind of way back then as well and so you know had I asked for money they probably would have said yes you can have it but you know being young and just you know straight out of school and stuff like that you know they kind of make you an offer and you say okay <laughs> because that's you know that's that's just the way it is right and so yeah so I'm sure they I mean just like any other company they they kind of take as much advantage as they can yeah so that was one of the reasons that that I kind of ended up leaving I was like what were they and yeah, and obviously once I said I was going to leave, they were like, hey, hey, hang on, you know, do you want a big pay raise? I'm like, yeah, I did, but you should have, you shouldn't have really been taking that big advantage of me all this time. So I ended up leaving anyway, but. <laughs> no, exactly. Even part of us, I don't know, I don't want to speak for you, but I think in, in my case, for example, when I wasn't on the visa and the company helped me to, to get a sponsor to stay in the country, you kind of feel like you, yeah. you own something to them. So you don't want to, I don't know, even if they pay you less or they treat you differently and somehow you are kind of 
um, how you say it. Well, you feel um, obligated, right? Like you feel obli- exactly. Yeah, obligated. you feel like that obligation. Like they took the they they took the risk of sponsoring me and paying for the legal, you know, the sort of filing of the legal papers and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, you certainly feel like there's a certain obligation that you have to to kind of stick with them. And uh, you know, even even if there's other opportunities, you feel like well, I should stay because they took that chance on me as well. But then, yeah, like someone said, found out, like they were, they, yes, I was being taken advantage of. Uh, that, that kind of turned my stomach a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but when you moved to the US, there was like a many people from overseas, from England or from other countries when you started in the, in the startup? Um, well, yeah, because it was an Australian company. So there was a lot of people that came over from Australia. Was, I was one of about three people that came over from England as well. So that, that really helped me, I think, right? Like, because there was a lot of people in the same kind of situation, just landing in San Francisco. They didn't know anything about the city. They didn't know anything about the country, just kind of learning and kind of exploring. I think that really helped me. And like, I think, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, had I moved over in that, I was the only person who was new, who, who didn't know anything about the area and stuff, I think, I think it would have been much harder. It would have, it would have been much harder to kind of assimilate and to kind of meet people and things like that. But because, yeah, there was probably, I mean, I think the company was about 25 when, when, when I landed in San Francisco. And I'd say probably half of those were from, yeah, people from Australia or people from England, which made life a lot easier, I think. Did the company help you even to find accommodation, find a place to stay? They put me up in a hotel, well, like short term for like a month so I could I could find, you know, and they, they kind of arranged to talk to like an agent in terms of seeing different apartments and things like that. I think for the first the first three or four weeks that I was in San Francisco, I didn't have to pay rent or anything like that. They, they kind of took care of, of kind of that while I was looking for a place to actually stay instead. So yeah, so they, they did take care of me, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> I'll ask you that question because I heard other people on, on the show, they moved to the US and one of the problems was one of the struggles or one of the obstacles was to try to find a place to stay to have a lease being approved for a lease in the US was kind of tricky. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, obviously the sort of, the, the landlord wanted to speak to somebody at the company to make sure that, you know, I was there and I would be there for a long time and things like that. So yeah, it wasn't as easy as just kind of walking into, you know, walking into an apartment and just signing some papers. It was, it did end up taking, I think I ended up having to uh, make a larger like security deposit as well. I think we ended up having to uh, make it like an extra month's worth of security deposit as well so that, so that they felt more comfortable with us kind of moving in and, you know, and, and, and us not having a history and, and kind of all that stuff as well. I mean, there's like a, so many benefit to move abroad with the company, with the company yeah. backing you up because all of these little steps. First of all, you move to a new country, you already have a, an income, you already have a place yeah. to go. You, they help you with fine accommodation. And in this case, they help you to prove that you can pay the rent in the next month, all of that. And also, Correct me if I'm wrong, but even like having meeting new people, you probably moved there, you already knew somebody because you were coming yep. from the same company. Even then, like starting a new life in a new environment, in a new country, at least you have something, it's like people that you already know. Yeah, no, no, abs- I, that's what I said, I, absolutely. And and yeah, and, it, and you, you almost just start off your new life almost immediately, right? Like I started to go to the office every day. I would start to meet people, new people every day who were in the office, even though you know I, I didn't know them when I first moved over. And then yeah, just just kind of naturally, like you just go to lunch with some people and or you go to dinner with some people after work and they introduce you to other people because they know other people as well. And so just, just being a part of that little circle there and just kind of expanding out of that much easier than if you're there alone and you don't know anybody, and yeah, you can try and try and meet people. It's really, it's really hard. And uh, and yeah, no, I think I think yeah, I, I, being able to move and have that kind of little circle of people that you work with already, I think, is really really helpful. Absolutely. And do you still live in San Francisco? No. So <laughs> I lived in San Francisco for about three years. Uh, actually, two years, and then um, somebody I worked with in San Francisco had moved to New York, and he was working at a little company in New York. And one afternoon, he picked up the phone and called me and said, "Mobs, do you want to move to New York?" And I said, "New York, New York, so good they named it twice. Absolutely, yes, please." <laughs> it's got a different weather. 
completely different weather, uh, but more more like what I was used to, uh, having come from England anyway. So it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't that bad. I, I was I was expecting it. it. It's probably a little bit colder actually than than kind of where I lived, but. But no, so yeah, so that was one of those, that was kind of another one of these weird situations where I was actually at work one day, it was a Friday, I still remember it, and it was, I was at, I was at the office and and my friend called me and was like, you know, so I'm trying not to speak too loudly because there's other people around me in the office and, and yeah, I've just basically just been asked if I want to go to New York. And and so yeah, I'm saying yes please without with 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 without trying to be too obvious about the fact that I might be leaving as well. And then yeah, and then I think it was about a month after that that I was on a plane and uh, uh headed to New York instead. What make you stay in the, in the US and not try to another country or another opportunity? Um, I mean, at the time, I wasn't, wasn't really looking for, uh, you know, I wasn't really looking to leave San Francisco or anything like that. I was really happy there. Um, you know, I was really happy to be working on, you know, working as part of this sort of internet space and stuff. So I wasn't really looking to leave. So I think, you know, had had my friend not called and kind of offered me a position, I'd probably still be in San Francisco right now, probably. <laughs> but um, but no, so it was just completely one of those things where it's just like, you know, somebody offers you and that sort of opportunity. And then, you know, and like I said, it was New York too, right? Like, it's like when you're young, you kind of hear about big cities. And what do you hear about? You hear about like New York and, and you know, obviously I grew up in London, which is a big city. You hear about LA and New York. And, and so when, when somebody picks up the phone and says, hey, do you want to move to New York? York and that's not an opportunity you can turn down often I don't think <laughs> yeah no fair enough even though if you're watching the movies every time when the aliens come to the planet or they want to destroy a city usually it's New York so I don't know if it's a place, safe place to be <laughs> uh, that's probably true but why well, yeah, we could talk about that in a little bit because I was I was I was in New York uh, well for like 9-11 and stuff so so yeah so that's that's the whole thing as well <laughs> oh that's true yeah 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 so did you, you, you had to stick around even after the 9-11 happened um well i the, well, the funny thing is i don't I, I don't live in new york city anymore like i live two hours north of new york city now um so yeah so at the time i was living in in new york city well so i'm when i, I guess <laughs> it's a bit longer story than that unfortunately but yes i moved to new york city I was there for about two years working at kind of various startups and things. And then I left to go to Boston for a year. And then I moved back to New York. And that's when 9-11 happened. And it's it's funny because it's, um, well, it's not funny, but it's, you know, it, it's, I, sh- I should say it's, it's kind of interesting because I used to work at 65 Broadway, which was like a block away from where the World Trade Center used to be. But I was living in Westchester County at the time, so I'd started doing remote work by then. So half the time I was working from home, half the time I was working in an office in New York. And just so, you know, just so happened to me that I wasn't in New York City on that specific day, just pure luck, just because I was like, I don't feel like, you know, it was just that, that schedule that week where it was like, and which day am I going to be in the office? And it just so happened to me that I was I was not in New York City. I was I was close, but not. Yeah, so I was there watching. I used to work for a company that special that was focused on um, stock market information, and so I would wake up every morning to watch the stock market open and kind of watch the stock market and and sort of all things like that. And just my normal day, I would wake up around sort of eight o'clock and start watching the news and start watching, you know, start getting ready for the market to kind of kind of open. And instead of the market opening, you, know, you kind of see all these planes crashing into things and uh and it just kind of it just hits you that I could have been there like I could have been in the city like kind of when that happened and stuff but but no but it you know obviously I I was fortunate I was lucky that I wasn't in the city and I I mean even though I was yeah I wasn't affected by it directly it does have an impact on you um just because of of what it is yeah totally and have you ever considered leaving the U.S. and moving back to England and moving somewhere else? Or? Um, I mean, it, I mean, now that you know, I, like I said, I met my wife, and we're you know, obviously, I now have a wife and kids and a house, and you know, all of that stuff. It, it, it's a much, it's a much harder thing to do. I will admit, and you know, once the present that we have right now came in, it did certainly cross my mind. You know, like is this the kind of country I want to live in now? And, and frankly, had he won again uh, in, this, in this recent election, I think we would have considered it a lot more. But thankfully, <laughs> we don't have him for much longer. And, uh, and I think, uh, I mean, I think, look, I mean, honestly, 
I mean, I still, I think I would still want to live in a big modern kind of area, right? Like whether it's somewhere in Europe or somewhere, you know, somewhere in England or, or something like that again, there's kind of risk everywhere, right? So, yeah, so so being, not being in New York, you know, not being in, uh, in sort of LA or, you know, not being in California, you know, would, would there still be risk in England or in some parts of Spain or Europe or, you know, so, I mean, I think there will still be risk from that kind of, terrorist angle at least in terms of like a president like trump yeah that that probably wouldn't be much risk of that in in much of the rest of the world <laughs> maybe in italy <laughs> <laughs> well i mean even in england i mean like there was a lot of people that were very worried when boris johnson got to be in charge too so <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, because you like, grew up pretty much in England and mm-hmm. moved to the US, the culture is the same language, but the culture is, is different. Yeah. Have you ever maybe thought maybe, I don't know, I can relate it to the, more to the culture in England, maybe I fit in more in England, or maybe like, no, actually, this is the place I want to be because I feel like this is the place where I can call home. Yeah, I mean, I definitely thought about that. And I, th- I think in many ways I fit in more here just in terms of, you know, the sort of work that I do and... Even though I grew up in England a lot, I mean, I think I grew up watching a lot of American TV and watching a lot of American culture on TV and things like that too. So it didn't feel very foreign to kind of be here. It kind of, it felt, it felt very natural. I mean, there's obviously things I miss from England and especially in things like sports and things aren't quite the same here. But, uh, but yeah. But like soccer. In, like, yeah, like <laughs> soccer. I, I still have to wake up. I have to wake up really early now to watch it instead. But, um, but no, I think, I think, you know, I think, yeah, I'm very happy here. Uh, I'm, I, it's one of those things that's weird now that I think about it. It's like now, you know, with the way that technology is, I mean, I could literally live and work anywhere. Like, it, it, I don't have to be in New York. I don't have to be in the US. I could, I could be anywhere in the world as long as I had the internet. I can, I can do what I do. And just like we're doing this podcast now, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm in New York or Europe or whatever. You know, I think now there's the opportunity. You know, if I was young and single now, yeah, I, I think I would like, I mean, I think that's the one thing I would do right now is, travel a lot more and see a lot more of the world because I think I think it's much easier now and 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 not do it and be able to do it while maintaining employment and have a job and still be able to work and see a lot of the world as well yeah no totally even because people like you like software development they are like in so high demand all over the yeah. place everywhere in the world you can find a job in uh, and also as you said you can work remotely you can be even be in Thailand and yeah. work for a company in the US yeah, uh, well, especially with the pandemic, like, you know, since, once everybody shut down their offices and people had to go work from home, people, I think a lot more people, you know, understood that, you know, I don't have to go to the office every day. I don't have to be there every day and, and you can still get the work done. I mean, still, you know, the world's still turning and things are still happening. And, uh, and yeah, I've been, I've been fortunate. Like I started working remotely in so this was when I left New York the first time so in July of 2000 was when I started my first remote work and I've been pretty much remote ever since (laughs) Um, oh wow yeah I mean like that when when I moved back to New York that was you know like I said I was I was still spending three or four days working from home two or three days in the office instead so but really I was still working I was still a remote kind of worker at that point as well so yeah for the last 20 years I've really had I've had the opportunity to kind of work remotely instead that's a really good advantage yeah and do you have any regrets about living in England or living living in your country um yeah I mean I think I think to some degree because I because I was four when I moved to England even though England was all I knew it was almost but it, it was always like yeah, but it's not really your home either, right? Like, I mean, because I was originally from Pakistan, so, you know, was I officially Pakistan? Yeah, because I was born in Pakistan. I was four when I moved. So, I mean, I think had I been born in England, I think it would have been harder to kind of say I'm leaving my homeland. But it I kind of like I, said, I already felt like I left my homeland already. Uh, so leaving England to come to America was, I think, much easier than, you know, had I been born in England. Now, obviously, I come from a pretty big family. So I think that was the sort of hardest. It was... It, it, <laughs> Also, it's hard because there's obviously, you know, you know my, my mom and my, my sister and my brothers and stuff. And, and yeah, I had lots of aunts and uncles and things too. So, yes, you miss, you know, you miss that interaction. But because I come from such a big family, 
in some ways it was nice to be away from them too. Like, because all of a sudden it was like, oh shit, yeah, I, I can be alone now. You know, when, when I was home, there was always somebody at the house, right? Like whether it was an uncle or an aunt or somebody, somebody was always visiting and it was always very hard to get some peace and quiet and stuff. So when I moved to San Francisco, I was like, wow, this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, after a while, you kind of turn, like I said, after a while of that peace and quiet, you do like, oh, I do miss, you know, I miss hanging out with those guys too. But, uh, but yeah, but it was, so it was kind of a mix, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely miss that, but also having the opportunity to kind of do my own thing and, and, and not be concerned about, uh, you know, somebody always being at the house too was, was, was also really a positive as well. <laughs> No one comes down to laundry. In that case, by me, I mean, something around will be... Would be well, would I mean, I, eventually I started to cheat. Once, once I moved to New York, eh, well, when I lived in San Francisco, I lived in an apartment and they had a kind of a laundry like right on the floor that I was on. So it was just a matter of just like hopping over to the laundry. But when, once I moved to New York, I moved to an apartment that didn't have like, uh, it didn't have any uh, laundry. So I would actually just take my laundry to the laundromat and they would just wash it for me. So I didn't even have to do my laundry anymore. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that was the best thing about New York, I think. <laughs> Not only do my <laughs> laundry anymore. <laughs> and so we were we spoke before that the immigration process, the moving to America was fairly easy for you. There was any like a challenges that you had to face when you moved to the US? I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, the thing with the visa process and stuff, like I said, is, I mean, there was that problem with the H-1B visas where, you know, like I said, you were kind of, re you were restricted about who you could work for. I mean, I would have loved to start my own company when I was really younger, but I really couldn't because of the H-1B visa stuff that I was on. Um, and then once we started to start the process of a green card and becoming a citizen and doing all that kind of stuff, that took a really long time. Like that took years. And, you know, at that point, you know, I had got married, we had kids and stuff. So it was, it was kind of stressful in terms of like, are they going to approve my visa? Are they going to approve my citizenship? I mean, are we going to have to leave? Because, um, because yeah, because you, you, you don't know like what their process is and they do all of their background checks and things. And, you know, I didn't think they were going to find anything and I guess they didn't find anything, but, but, but you'd never really know. And it took a really long time and, and it happened, you know, like I said, we were going through the process when 9-11 happened as well and then you know that that whole thing just you know it just kind of threw everything for a loop at that point as well because you just don't know how things are going to change in terms of what what are the rules who are they going to allow in who are they not going to allow in i'm coming originally from pakistan living in england as well you know yeah considering you know who the 9-11 attackers were and stuff just i think just kind of amped things up a little bit as well there just in terms of you know what what the reaction to people will be as well so yeah not not stuff that you can control or anything like that but it's just that's just the sort of world and then the world kind of happens around you but yeah i think that was that was really stressful yeah no i bet because i don't know maybe you couldn't even like a plan your life in a maybe even like a buy a house why would you buy a house if you don't even know if you're gonna stay you don't have the certainty that you can stay in the country. Yeah, I mean, it makes it hard because, like, even because once you're once you're applying for the visa, they put restrictions on you in terms of like you can't leave the country and stuff, and and so yeah, so you can't really plan a holiday, and you know, like if you wanted to go overseas for a vacation and stuff, you have to go. You actually have to go ask the government that I'm going to go for a vacation. Can I go on a vacation? <laughs> you know, things like that too. So uh, yeah, so it does. I mean, it does. It just puts it. It just it just makes things more complicated while you're waiting for things to kind of work themselves out. But I mean, kind of yeah. Fortunately, you know, everything kind of worked out fine in the end, and uh, kind of everything went through. It went through fairly smoothly. It just took a lot longer than we were expecting. <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, you don't even know what the outcome right. is going to be. Right, and then and then yeah. I mean, what if they say no? Like, I mean, like your kind of mind starts to kind of churn. Like, okay, if they say no, what do we do? Like. I mean, I'm not going to leave my family, which means my family's going to have to leave with me. So, like, where do we go? Do we go back to England? Do we go to some, you know, somewhere else in Europe? Do we move to Canada? I mean, I don't know. Like, you know, it's like, what? Yeah, you know, you, you, your mind just starts spinning at that point as well. <laughs> and is your wife American? Yes. So if you move abroad, that becomes the opposite problem because then right. your, your, your partner, your wife becomes the immigrant. Yes. <laughs> needs to go through the process and everything. So it's yeah. not, it's never like an easy process. No, exactly. So, And if, if your partner has a career, even then, why would he carry on and try to build a career if you didn't even know if your family can stay in the country? That's another 
problem when yeah. you're in the situation. Yeah, and then it's, it's the same, right? Like it's like, are we blocked from coming back to the US ever? Or is it just a, you know, is it just a temporary thing? Or, you know, so it, yeah, so it's just, it puts you into that kind of cycle of, uh, you know, are we just moving temporarily or are we going to move? And then that's it. We're just never coming back. But then, you know, she's got family here. So we obviously do want to come back and she wants to visit her parents and her siblings and things like that too. So yeah, having split family like that, I think would have been really hard, but yeah, so I mean, it was still different for me because I'd, I'd kind of already made the move in terms of I'd made that choice to kind of leave and, and kind of move over here. But I think it would have been it would be much harder on her, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. What's the biggest upside about being an immigrant, about immigrating? I, I mean, I think for me, it was just that sort of opportunity to kind of work in, in the industry that I was. I mean, I could have carried on working, you know, in kind of England and stuff, but, you know, just to be around, you know, San Francisco and to be even in, even in New York to, and, and to have the opportunity to kind of work on the kind of things that I was working on with the kind of technology that I was working on, I don't think would have happened um, over in England. So I think that was that was a huge opportunity. And then again, you know, like I said, back then and even still now, like just being in San Francisco, being able to meet the kind of people that I met and have the opportunity to work with the kind of people that I did just wouldn't have happened anywhere else in the world, I don't think. So, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm always really grateful of that. And, you know, the, these days you can do a lot more stuff online, but, but honestly, if you're, if you're just starting out in any kind of career, you kind of have to be in the place that, you know, that's the most popular place to be. So, so even now, even, you know, if I was graduating school now, I think I would still want to move either to New York or San Francisco or, or even LA, depending on what kind of work I wanted to do. But I, I would, I would still highly recommend people, you know, if you have that option and you're young and you're single, especially it makes life a lot easier, but just, just to kind of immerse yourself in something like that, uh, I think it, it's much easier uh, kind of if you're there and able to do it in person, I think. Yeah, just like for the connection you can create or the, yeah. the, just the, the mentality, the mindset that being around the same kind of people with the same kind of mentality, the same kind of goal. Yeah. It's like to be an actor and, and be in Hollywood. You can't, you can't be an actor and be, I don't know, in London. I mean, <laughs> you can be an actor, but at the same time, it's like if you want to be like a, a movie star, you kind of need to move to, to LA. I, th I think the thing that really struck me about San Francisco is that that's all people think about, right? Like, I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way, right? Like, I, you know, people wake up, they think about technology, they think about startups, they think about internet. It's it's all that they think about all day long. And, you know, you, you run into people in, you know, when you're grabbing lunch, that's all they're thinking about. When you run into people like after work and they're at a bar or something, that's all they're talking about. And it's, it's just amazing to kind of be able to tap into that whenever, right? Like, I mean, that was always the sort of hard part when, you know, even when I left San Francisco and I, and, and I left New York City to kind of be upstate, it's much harder to kind of find people to talk to and to kind of engage a, about what's happening in the industry and, and things like that. When I was in San Francisco, it was the complete opposite, right? Like that's all people would think about. That's all we would talk about. Uh, it was very much easier to kind of stay plugged in and, and be a part of the scene and everything because that's literally everybody talks about it all the time. And yeah, I mean, yeah, at some point you've got to step away to and do, do other things, but but it's but it's okay. But for me at least, I, like I said, it's it's okay to really immerse yourself in that stuff for a while and, and really soak up as much as you can. Actually, when I left Italy, my goal was to actually to move to Silicon Valley, to move to San Francisco, because I wanted to be in that environment. I wanted to work for a, a big tech company or like a startup. I wanted to be in that environment. But because I couldn't find a job because I didn't speak English when I decided to leave Italy, I had to take the long route. So I had to go through New Zealand and now Canada. <laughs> in the meantime, my mind has changed, but that, that was my goal at the time because I, that's where I wanted to be. And I knew San Francisco was the place to, to be. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think the world's changed around us a little bit now. So it's a little bit easier to, to kind of do the same kind of things that you would do, be, be able to do in San Francisco, but to be able to do them elsewhere. And, you know, but I, I still think, you know, like, yeah, there's still big advantages to being able to do it. It's obviously there's, there's some, you know, there's some drawbacks too in terms of it's very expensive and <laughs> all sorts of things like that too. So, but no, I think if you can swing it and I think, you know, and if that's the kind of career that you want to, you'll just give yourself such a head start um, if you can. Yeah, you said like it's expensive, but 
I, I didn't know when I left it because I was, as you said before, yeah, I grew up watching like American TV shows <laughs> and movies. So I was watching Big Bang Theory and they were like living in an apartment, <laughs> right. like this huge apartment. They were like not making a lot of money and they were like living, f- I was like, that can't be a problem. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah, TV makes it sound <laughs> pretty straightforward and easy, but uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunately not quite that simple. <laughs> I think I read an article uh, not long ago and they were discussing about how much the rent of this oh. like, uh, like a place it would cost, even like the apartment from friends. Yes. I don't know how much of it would cost a month because like it was a huge apartment and, and they were not making much money. People, even like in friends, some people didn't have, even have a job, but they were able yeah. to pay the rent. It was just, <laughs> yeah, the reality is it's quite different. Yeah, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have been living in an apartment across from, from Central Park. They would have been in like out in Queens or something instead. <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> and do you feel lucky to be an immigrant? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, in many ways, like I said, I did it twice, right? One because my father kind of, uh, kind of made made us all move, and then I was able to do it again when I left England. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, I think I got a huge advantage of, ha- of being able to live in England and have an awesome education. I left university in England. I didn't have, I didn't owe any money, anything. I was actually one of the last years where the UK government was actually giving you a grant to co-study, right? So they paid me to go study, which was awesome. So I, mean, I think they've changed that now a long time ago now. But uh, so, yeah, I felt, I mean, like now, you know, I, I speak to people and, and my daughter's going to be attending college here soon as well. And just like looking at how expensive it is and how much, you know, how much she's going to have to pay to just to attend college. So, you know, I feel like I had a really good opportunity there in terms of having an education and, and you know, not having to, not, not having to pay a huge amount for it. And then, and then to have the opportunity to go and kind of work in San Francisco for a while and then, and then on sort of East Coast here as well. Yeah, I, f- I feel like being an immigrant opened up a lot of opportunity that I wouldn't have had. Um, had. Obviously, if I was still in Pakistan, I don't know what I would be doing right now. But, you know, even in England, I mean, I think, you know, I probably would have, you know, I would have found a high tech job, you know, somewhere in England, but it still wouldn't have been quite uh, the, the same experience and the same opportunities that I've had because I was here. And now your children, they have, they are like the children of immigrants. Are yes. you, do you have like the high standard as your parents, like your parents did, or you feel like you're a little bit more loose? Uh, Actually, are you expectation more than higher standards? <laughs> no, I mean, I, th- I think I think it's slightly different. I think it's more of a generational thing now. Like, I mean, like, I think kids actually have, at least, I mean, I felt like my whole generation had this high amount of pressure on them in terms of like figure out what you want to do with your life and you have to go to college and then you have to go study and then you have to go start a career and stuff like that I'm I'm hoping that my kids kind of figure out what they want to do because I think that's the hardest bit is like I mean I was very lucky like I said I started to play with computers when I was eight years old and kind of just fell into being able to write software and, and kind of work on computers and stuff but I know you know there's plenty of people who still haven't quite figured out what they want to do with their lives and who they want to work for and what kind of work do they want to do and things like that. So I, I think I've been just trying to encourage my kids as much as I can to figure out what it is that they want to do and what it is and what it is that they want to be. Because I, I think you can have an impact on the world doing whatever you want to do. I don't think you have to be you know, a, a specific career. You don't have to be a lawyer or an attorney or anything. You know, you don't have to be an accountant <laughs> to kind of have an impact. Because, you know, if you want to be a doctor, you can have an impact. If you want to write software, hopefully I've shown that you can have an impact as well. And so, yeah, so I think, I think, I think you can have an impact doing whatever you want to do. And if you, if you can figure out what that is, then I think that, um, that's, that's the first step, I think. But at the same time, it's okay to change your mind. If you started oh, yeah. to become a lawyer and you turn it like, a, you know what, I don't like this job, but you change yeah. it, become a software engineer or whatever, or vice versa, whatever. Yeah. I think even changing is good. No, I mean, I think my wife and I probably disagree a little bit on this, but that's, and that's okay too. But I mean, I would be fine if, you know, if my kids came to me and said, you know, after high school, I want to just take that year off. I want to go and explore the world. I want to go see, you know, what, 
you know, what the world has to offer and to figure out what I want to be, to figure out what I want to do. I think that's the right time to do it, right? Like, don't wait till after you spent four years in university and college, uh, yeah, spent lots of money and then be like, I don't really like what I was doing right now. Like, yeah, figure out first and then you can spend the four years to, to kind of have the education that you need and all that kind of stuff too. So uh, absolutely, I think, I think it's worth just kind of exploring who you are, exploring what the world has to offer and figure it out um, without, without too much pressure to actually figure it out as well. <laughs> I'm 30, almost 35 and I'm still figuring out what I want to do in life. <laughs> I changed like my career like multiple times. I'm still changing. Yeah. I mean, I tell people I'm really lucky. Like I, if I think back and look at it, I, 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 I was lucky. I didn't really choose to be a software engineer. I mean, it was like, it was just like, it just happened. Like, you know, I just started playing with computers and I liked it. But because of the skills that I picked up as a software engineer, I worked on sporting events, I've done stock market stuff, I built websites for bathroom companies, for TV studios, for films, you know, I've done st- you know, I've done so many different things. I've had this opportunity to work in so many different industries with with lots of really amazing people because I was lucky because I happened to be able to do this thing called write software. Um, you know, like I didn't choose something that was so siloed and so specific that it just opened up so many opportunities, I think. that and I think that's the thing that I've tried to, you know, express to my kids is like, it's not so much, you know, what do you want to do? It's like, what's, what's the skills that you want? What's the things that will make you be able to do what you really want to do? So learn skills, don't worry about a specific career. Yeah, because correct me if I'm wrong, even you, you'll... You're lucky that you discover programming and software developer. But at the same time, you got almost 100 different side <laughs> projects. They are like, it seems like even you, even if it's the same topic, the same fundamental, but at the same time, even you, you, you change your mind quite a few oh. times in the things that you wanted to build and the things that you want to pursue it. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you look, yeah, I have built close to 100, not quite there yet, but soon. Um, but no, I mean, like, yeah, there's some that are about. Uh, I mean, I like to watch movies. So there's four or five projects in there about Hollywood and the movie industry. I like football, soccer. So there's a few sports ones in there as well. So yeah, there's a good mix of things that kind of allow you to kind of do the things that you enjoy outside of the thing that you do for a job. But it just so happens that, you know, the thing I like to do for a job is the thing that I like to do when I'm not working as well. But but then, you know, I try and pair it with those other things as well so that then I'm, I'm kind of enjoying, even though it's still work uh, because I'm writing code and stuff but it's also making things that I, I kind of enjoy and and hopefully the sort of other people who find them will enjoy it as well <laughs> going back and thinking back what you've done in uh, in your life is there anything that you wouldn't have done differently no I mean I think given the the sort of the age and and the sort of world at the time i mean like i said i think right now if if i was 20 right now if i was or if i was just leaving college or if i was leaving high school right now i would i think i would travel a lot more like i would see a lot more of the world i would i don't think i did that enough when i was young and but you know but I don't think I had that opportunity when I was younger just because the world isn't the same as it is right now. But I I think these days people have a lot more options, right? There's more flexibility in the world. Back then, like I said, I had to go to university to get the piece of paper that meant that I could do the job that I wanted to do even though I could already write code. Now, you know, if I was 16 right now, I could build websites and people would hire me because they can see that I can build websites. That, That was an option for me when I was 16. So I think I think you kind of have to take the best advantage of the opportunities that are there. And I think right now you people have way more options, way more opportunity than they even think they do. And and I think yeah. So right now, if I was young and single and and just finishing school, I think yeah, just like I left when I, I finished school, but I left because the work, you know, that that opportunity was there for me. I think now you can make that opportunity for yourself as well. Do you think he would have left uh, England anyway, even without that opportunity? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I think there would have been a short window of uh, where, you know, had I not got off of the job in San Francisco, I may well have like traveled a little bit more, like more in Europe specifically. And I may have traveled to the United States as well. 
but I don't think I would have like left and like become an immigrant myself kind of in that sense. I think I, I probably would have traveled more, but not left. <laughs> Why? Because you think it would have been too hard? I think because of my upbringing and because of, you know, being part of the, of, of the big family and stuff, I think, you know, just that the pull of that would have just kind of, would have kept me closer to home, I think. Yeah. And that's the funny thing in life because if you didn't have the opportunity, now you wouldn't have met your wife and, right. and have the family that you have. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's crazy. If yeah. you're thinking of that, like, um, what was the movie? Um, Sliding Doors? Yes, I said, yeah. Well, and, it's, and there's been lots of things that too. Like, I mean, I, I, I do often wonder, like, what if I hadn't left San Francisco? Like, I mean, like, if my friend hadn't called me up and said, like, hey, do you want to move to New York? Like, uh, yeah, like I said, I probably would still be in San Francisco right now as well. And my life wouldn't be anything like it is now. Again, I met my wife in New York, so I wouldn't have met my wife as well. I mean, maybe I'd have a... I'd have some other wife instead. I don't know, but but it's uh, but yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think those are the two things, right? Like if if I hadn't if I hadn't put a certain thing on my resume when I was at school, then I wouldn't have been found by the little internet company that was looking for somebody who was looking for that specific skill. They wouldn't have hired me. I would still be at Oracle more than likely. I would have still stayed at Oracle even though I wasn't happy. It was my first job. I wasn't looking for a job. I wasn't looking for work at the time. They just happened to find me in some resume database and they, they called me up and said, you know, would you consider leaving? And well, yeah, I wasn't very happy at Oracle, but it was a good job, right? You know, it was my first job. I was being paid well. I wasn't happy, but I was like, I was satisfied, I guess. And so, yeah, it was just one of those little things where you're like, well, you know, had, had I not put that thing on my resume, I'd still be there. <laughs> yeah, that, like it's small little things in life. And I was Steve job would say that you can connect the dots just looking by looking backwards. You can't yeah. connect the dots looking forward. Right. <laughs> yeah, so it, true. It's, yeah, because it, it, it's funny. Yeah, thinking back, like I got my job at Oracle six months before I graduated, like in January, they had offered me the job to go work at Oracle. So my, my last six months at, at university, I pretty much just, I just slacked off. They said, just look, as long as you pass and you have a degree, you can come work for us. So I was like, cool. <laughs> it's like, I, I get six months off. Um, but then I started working there and it was like, oh my God, it was such a pain. It was so, it was so painful. And then, like I said, randomly, I, yeah, because I, it was just, the fact that I even submitted a resume somewhere because I already had a job in like January of that year. And so it was just randomly that, you know, somebody found my name in some resume database and offered me a job to go move to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, because Oracle is a huge company. You couldn't be set for life. You could have like just retire by just they, working for Oracle. They were the second, well, they, I don't know if they still are, but they were the second biggest software company in the world at sort of at the time. And it, I mean, the main reason it was, it was a pain for me at the time, at least, was I was working in England and I should say... I think it was kind of the way that Oracle worked, but back then again, you kind of had to have like that centralized organization stuff. So even though I was working in, in England, for us to do anything, we had to get approval from head office and head office was in San Francisco. And so, you know, there's an eight hour time difference between <laughs> England and San Francisco. And so there was often a lot of times where you were just kind of sitting around waiting for San Francisco to wake up so that you could ask them if you could do the thing that you wanted to do. And you know, like I said, after after a few months of that, I was like, "This is ridiculous. You can't you can't do business like this. You can't, I can't work like this." And so, I mean, but like I said, I was I was getting paid. I would I would have still been there. Like I I wouldn't have cared if they carried on paying my salary. If they want me to sit around twiddle my thumbs for six hours a day because you know I got to wait for San Francisco to wake up. Okay, <laughs> you're Maybe paying me. they would have offered you to move to San Francisco, even if well, you stay in Oracle. That's the yeah. funny thing is after I moved to San Francisco, like four of the people that I worked with in, inside of Oracle ended up working for a year in San Francisco as well. So yeah, so they had stuck it out at um, Oracle and then we were still email and stuff, you know, even back then. And they were like, Bubs, guess what? We're, we're going to be in San Francisco <laughs> for, for, for at least the next year as well. And, and again, uh, this, is, this is another fun little story. 
I would never have gone skydiving <laughs> had my friends come, not move, come from Oracle in England to San Francisco. Again, I was in San Francisco and one, and they had come to San Francisco with Oracle and they called me up one, one weekend. They were like, we're going skydiving this weekend. Would you like to go skydiving? <laughs> And I was like, okay, let's go skydiving. But uh, again, I, I never would have gone skydiving if they hadn't called me that that kind of one weekend. <laughs> was that after watching Point Breaks? For, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was just, they, I, yeah, they were a little bit more, you know, outgoing and, and, uh, and adventurous than I was. But uh, I guess I could be, I could be roped into those things. <laughs> Um, for the listeners that uh, they may be on the same situation, the same fields in the same industry, do you have any particular advice for them to, if they want to leave the country? Uh, I mean, like I said, right now, I mean, you know, technology makes it so that you can work from wherever you want to. Like I would just, I think the, sort of the, the one thing I would do now if I could was just, you can now travel to wherever you want to to see if you like the place, right? Like, I mean, I took a leap of faith that I was going to live in San Francisco I'd never been to San Francisco. I'd never seen San Francisco before. And, and, and to just kind of move there, I think, was kind of a big risk. But now, nowadays, you can, you can co-visit places for a month or two to see if it's something that you want to do. So I think that's my only recommendation now is just like, you can work from wherever you are, you can, or you can take some time off or whatever, but travel, see if it's, if it's a place that you think you really like. Uh, and then if it is, yeah. Well, I mean... And, and to really experience something, um, to really get a feel for a city or a country and stuff, you do have to be there for a few months at least. So even if you don't want to be there for long term, yeah, be there for a few months, be there for three to six months at least so that you can really experience the people and the and sort of kind of everything that that place has to kind of offer. I mean, I, I've done some traveling just in, you know, just taking kind of holidays and things. And yeah, you see all the touristy stuff that you kind of feel like you have to see, but, uh, but to really know New York and to really know San Francisco, for example, the place that I've lived, you know, you kind of have to live there for a while and, and you know, become part of it uh, instead, of just, instead of just being uh, a tourist. Yeah, no, it's completely different being a tourist and be there for a couple of weeks and actually live there. Yeah. Just the things that you, you see, the things that you do, it's just, they're completely different. But you lived in San Francisco or New York. What city would you recommend for people to, to start their career in, into the tech industry? Tech industry. So tech industry, I mean, for, for tech, you, you kind of have to still say San Francisco. I mean, like it's, there's still just so much energy and so much happening in San Francisco. I mean, New York has other things. Like if you, know, if you told me that you wanted to go work in finance, work on, you know, work on the stock market stuff, then you go to New York. Even if you want to work in the advertising industry, for example, then yeah, maybe you go work in New York. If you want to work in the video game industry, then you have to move to LA. That's where all the big stuff's happening as well. But if you just want to be um, in, if you want to do software, you want to build stuff on the internet, there's no better place for that than San Francisco. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mabs, to share your story and share your, your knowledge. If people want to get in touch with you, what's the, what's the best way to, to reach out to you? Uh, the best way is actually on Twitter. I'm, I'm pretty active on there. Uh, I share lots of information about the stuff I'm working on and stuff. Uh, it's my full name, so it's at Mubashir Iqbal. Okay, I'll put everything in, uh, in the show notes. Might be easier. Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. We didn't even cover what you're doing. I would say we like a slightly covered <laughs> that you have like almost 100 projects, 100 websites uh, on your uh, portfolio. And they go from movies to podcasts. Recently, I think you launched a few about podcasting. Yeah, I've been doing that for a few years now, focused on the podcast industry. I think there's just a lot of opportunity here and I love being on podcasts. I love listening to lots of them as well. So absolutely. Yeah, we share the same passion about podcasting. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mabs, to, to take the time to do this interview. I really oh, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And yeah, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, and, and just to be clear, absolutely, if anybody has any questions or anything like that, uh, always really happy to chat with people, especially on Twitter as well. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mabs. All right. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Bye. See you, bye. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. You can find the show notes with everything discussed in this episode at immigrantslife.com slash episode 29. If you enjoyed this episode, you can share with your friends and please consider leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Podchaser. That will really help this show growing and reach more people. If you'd like to share your story and be my guest on the show, you can send me an email at stories at immigrantslife.com 
or visit immigrantslife.com slash your story. Thanks again for listening. Talk to you in the next one. Ciao.